agreed upon or they're not in agreement on the whole thing. So, you know, that's one thing. Then you have to look at the fact that uh, a lot of the stuff that we see from um, black people pertaining to Hebrews, we see how it changed from African people into the now uh, so-called Jews who we see in Israel today. So a lot of the stuff is we can't say 100 percent for sure comes from black Hebrews or, or who it actually comes from. But again, none of this gives validity to the doctrine of the Hebrews. It just shows you that it's old and that these people did exist and they were black. Now, again, when you want to go back and look at where did this doctrine come from, as you have been taught or read or heard from other Hebrews that the original uh, Torah, Tanakh, was written in Hebrew. Now, the whole thing is we never had that Tanakh or Torah. We never had that manuscript. You know, we go back to where we get the inception of the Hebrew Israelite doctrine. And as I always talk about, it begins with Ptolemy II, Philadelphia, who was a Greek, who basically was a fake pharaoh in Egypt due to conquest, who requested a Hebrew uh, translation of the Hebrew law into Greek from, you know, the Hebrews. And this is what LXX and the whole Septuagint thing, you know, this is how we get all that. So we get the Septuagint. But we don't have any proof of the documentation that was used to do this translation or any proof that this translation actually happened. And when you look at the uh, LXX, the letters of Orestius, uh, they are after the fact and they are not agreed upon by all scholars. And when you read the letters, it goes against the proven history of the Greeks themselves. Okay, so letters of Orestius. In this part, I want to read real quick because I believe it's an important part. It's a very long letter. There's a lot to it. So if you get a chance someday, go online and find it and read it and study it. Because when you start to compare it with actual history, when you start to compare it with the Bible, too, and we start to compare it with what we know, then, it, you know, it, stuff doesn't fit. Things doesn't, it don't work out when, <laughs> when you start to compare it to what we know. So it says here, go down to uh, Lazarus Arresti, it started at 35. It says, King Ptolemy sends greetings and salutations to High Priest Alizar, since there are many Jews settled in our realm who are carried off, who were carried off from Jerusalem by the Persians at the time of their power, and many more who came with my father unto Egypt as captives. Large numbers of these he placed in the army and paid them higher wages than usual. Now understand what he's saying here. He's saying that he took Jews. Now let's go to the Hebrew Israelite you know, definitions of Jews. According to them, they were black. They were black people. Like I said, I don't, I'm not disputing that. But according to this letter, we talk about the white Greeks took black Jews and put them into his army to fight against black Egyptians. This is what this letter is saying. So it goes on to say, and when he had proved the loyalty of their leaders, he built fortresses and placed them in their charge that the native Egyptians might be intimidated by them. And I, when I ascended the throne, adopted a kindly attitude towards all of my subjects and more particularly to those who were citizens of yours. You now, he's basically kissing the high priest's ass here. And it doesn't sound like setting up a Ptolemy and do. He's basically saying, hey, I liked your people. This is what happened. And, you know, I, I, I gave him jobs and I did this. And he's kissing his ass trying to get this thing done. But we got to realize that they had already conquered Israel. They under the rule of, of the Greeks. So why all this ass kissing? So let's keep going. I have set at liberty more than 100,000 captives paying their owners the appropriate market price for them. And if ever evil has been done to your people through the passion of the mob, I have made them reparations. The motive which prompted my action has been the desire to act poisonly and render unto the supreme God a thank offering for maintaining my kingdom in peace and great glory in all the world. Moreover, those of your people who were in the prime of their life, prime of life, I have drafted into my army and those who were fit to be attached to my person and worthy of the confidence of the court, I have established an official position. Now, since I am anxious to show my gratitude to these men and to the Jews throughout the world and to the generations yet to come, I have determined that your law shall be translated from Hebrew tongue, which is in use amongst you, into Greek language, 
that these books may be added to the other royal books in my library. So he's saying basically what I said, that we want this whole thing translated. But understand, for this translation, he's given up a lot. Now, if you get a chance to read the letter, and I'm going to go through the detail, but it goes in details of the wealth, all the gold and everything that he gives them for doing this. That's one thing. And 100,000 slaves he released. And he pays all the people who own slaves. Now, I understand Ptolemy II Philadelphus. Now, now I may have said Ptolemy the first before I just thought about that. If I said that, understand there's a lot of information going on in my head. I'm trying to get it out fast. So now at some point, these letters of Orestius ends up in Jewish hands. We know Josephus talks about the letters of Orestius. But now a lot of scholars didn't agree with the whole thing. They thought it was bogus. And it says here, Demetros of Philaron, a client of Ptolemy the first Soter, is not a good candidate as a collaborator with Ptolemy II Philadelphus. Now, this Demetros is basically the librarian who I told you about who went to Ptolemy II and said, hey, we need to get this whole thing in the library. We need to get this translation done. So listen to what he's saying. He's saying uh, Roger S. Bagnell notes that he made a strategic mistake at the beginning of the reign of supporting Ptolemy's older half-brother and was punished with internal exile dying soon after. So he's saying that, you know, this dude is not even a good candidate to put into this whole story because he died. He wasn't even really cool with Ptolemy II in Philadelphia. For Ptolemy to go ahead and give up 100,000 slaves and all these, all this gold and everything. So the whole thing is suspect just on that alone. And according to this dude, he was dead. So now another uh, critic says here, uh, physiological analysis by Louis Vives or Vives proposed that the pseudepigraphic letter was a forgery being written by an author living half a century after Ptolemy II of Philadelphia, 285 to 246 BC, and assuming the name of Orestius, the inconsistencies and anachronisms of the author examined and exposed first by Humphrey Huda, uh, 1659 to 1706, placed the writings closer to 170 to 130 BCE. So now that's like huge because these things supposed to have been written. We're talking about during the time of Ptolemy II of Philadelphia, which is like way before this day here. Now it goes on to say here, uh, this is Bruce, Bruce Metzger. He writes, most scholars who have analyzed the letters have concluded that the author cannot have been the man he represented himself to be, but was a Jew who wrote a fictitious account in order to enhance the importance of the Hebrew scriptures by suggesting that a pagan king had recognized the, their significance uh, and therefore arranged for their translation into Greek. So he's saying this whole thing was uh, basically a whole setup by the Jews. They made this whole letter up to give validity to the Hebrew version of the Old Testament because we know the Septuagint is in Greek and we know the Masoretes, they didn't agree with this whole thing and the whole Masoretic text, which came about later, we're talking about uh, 7th century to 10th century CE. Now the Masoretes went on ahead and created the Masoretic text, which is the Old Testament in Hebrew, this is where the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex comes from. They use the Masoretic text to uh, to reference. All of this was done, and then we look and see that you know, first of all, one, why we do all this for a translation of a law that he's not going to follow? That's that's stupid. Two, why would he do all this and then enforce Hellenization on Israel, knowing? that these people have a religion and that they wouldn't follow it and they would have to be forced to follow it. Two, they already had control of Israel during that time. It was just on the Greek control of Israel when they took it from the Persians, when the Persians took it from the Egyptians. And the Greeks had to take it from them by the Romans and then the Arabs took it from the Romans. But they had conquest of Israel. We know about Hellenization. So we know that the Greeks had their so-called religion or mythologies. Why would, why would he want a Hebrew law? For what? He says It says in the letters of Orestes he wanted for his library. But it doesn't make sense to do all that just to get a translation for your library where he could have went through other means and ways of getting that done. How the hell are we cursed? Think about that. We cursed because we disobeyed some law. 
some covenant, but everybody else get a pass. And you think that's fair. Everybody else get a pass and you think that's fair. When we see the kind of, you know, genocide and murder that Europeans have, you know, presented to this planet. They have gone against the Bible and every single commandment, every single thing that the Bible is supposed to stand for, they have went against. The same time Rome was pushing the Bible and pus pushing Christianity, they were going against the Bible. They was enslaving, raping, and murdering people. So you would not have no Bible if not for Rome. Plain and simple. You would not have the Bible at all if it wasn't for the Greeks. You can't find or prove that Africans had anything to do with that book before them. We can prove that they stole a lot of it from Egyptian mythology and created a bunch of allegorical uh, context to Greek mythology. So as I talked about before, when you go back in ancient times and you see, you know, the pictures of black artifacts or black paintings showing Jesus black and showing these people black, you have to understand history and what took place back then. Of course they will be black. When you see the Pope, you know, kneeling to the black Madonna, what have you, of course they will be black. When you understand history, you know, before the so-called uh, Romans or before it was called Rome or what have you, the people of that land were black, were African people, they were black people, whatever you want to say. They were dark skinned, to put it, you know, correctly or that way, but they were black. When you go back and you look at, again, as I said, ancient Israel, that land we call Israel, that land we call Phoenicia, before it was called these things by Greek and, and Roman people or what have you, uh, these were black people that occupied this land. Again, you can go back and look and see that Israel was a part of the Egyptian empire. Fact. So when you had the Persians go in there and invade it, it still was black people there. Same thing when the Greeks came in. Same thing when the Romans came in. And it's still these religions. Same thing when the, when the um, Arabs came in. And this is where you've seen a lot of people over time begin to flee and leave those areas or be uh, enslaved. So you still have black people there, of course, but not, you know, many of the originals or probably any of the originals that was there from so long ago. So, yeah, those lands were black people. And when the indoctrination happened of Judaism and eventually Christianity, there was black people that was first indoctrinated. So, of course, if you live in that area around that time and you get any stories about this so-called, you know, old, the Old Testament and Moses or what have you, of course, you would make the people black because they knew that it was black people around there during that time. Of course, Jesus is going to be black because the people who was around there living around that time knew there was nothing but black people. So they made those images black. Now, you had the so-called or what, the, what history tells us. You have the barbarians coming there, and the barbarians basically uh, caused the downfall of Rome, which, as I pointed out, it wasn't the downfall of Rome. It was the downfall of the black leadership of Rome and the rise of the papacy and the rise of the European control of Rome. So you had all that go out the door, and then you had the paintings change. You had everything that showed these parts of Europe and, these, and, and Israel and these other parts that was controlled by black people. You had that covered up and changed and to, you know, what we see today. But yes, as I said, they were black people. And black people was uh, side by side in the beginning of Christianity with the Romans to push Christianity because they had already been indoctrinated with Judaism and with the religion, you know, for hundreds of years. So when they got these people to accept Christianity and start pushing it, you had black people first pushing it. So this is why when you go back, you can look and see. But you have to understand what took place. Did the Greeks conquer black people? Yes. Did they conquer Israel where black people was? Yes. Did Rome as well? Yes. So everything fits. Everything fits. The same time we just so happened to get this doctrine with Ptolemy II of Philadelphia just happened to be the same time black people are in Israel. Black people are in those lands. It's not a coincidence. They were indoctrinated because one, as I showed you when I just came back from Kemet, Serapis. Look at this wannabe pharaoh right here. It's hot. 
I gotta keep it a certain temperature in here. But look at the face, clearly. This is the Greco-Roman era. You see how they try to decree themselves like us. Make Stella. See, it's all in Greek. Bullshit, all here. This is from the Greco-Roman era. Greco-Roman, when they came into Kemet and tried to basically, you know, be like us. Still our shit. You see they statues here, they're putting their own little section. They actually came into Kemet and carved themselves into a lot of the walls. Here is the actual statue of Serapis Christos right here. You can see him. Serapis. You can see when they had Zeus, Amon. So you can see where the stuff came from. Zeus, Amon. Everything that we tell you about this stuff, it's all here. It's no bullshit. It's here telling you the truth about how they stole from Kemet. You know, I show people the actual statue and the whole Greek Greco-Roman section in uh, the Cairo Museum and how they copied you know, off of our shit, off the Egyptian stuff. But you see the mixing of Greek and Egyptian things, but what they were trying to do was they were trying to push them as gods to these black people in, uh, in those lands in Egypt and uh, in the whole uh, former Egyptian empire. And it wasn't, they wasn't taking it. They wasn't accepting it. So they wasn't accepting worshiping some rapists or what have you because they understood where the stuff came from and what it was. They knew, still knew their history. So, you know, after the full conquest took place, this is where they began to indoctrinate or this is where they came up with Judaism and began to indoctrinate black people with that doctrine. So when you read in the Bible about the, you know, the Hivites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Girgashites and everything like that, all these people who was conquered by these so-called Israelites, these people were the indigenous people of these lands. These were black people. The Bible is trying to justify the conquering and genocide of black people, pointing this out. So when you understand this is what this story is about, and it's justifying these people coming in there and wiping these people out and taking the land, you gotta understand that these are talking about black people. The simple notion that you will identify with uh, people from Israel is fine, but you can't act like you can't say that these are only your people from Israel when these people came from Africa. These people came from from Kemet. So the fact that you are hooked on a doctrine and saying, "Well, no, we are originally from uh, uh, Israel. Israel is our home." I mean, that's bullshit. Your home is Africa. Your home is Kemet. Your home is many other places. Not just in one little teeny dusty ass piece of land. I've been to Israel. I will not trade it for Africa ever. Ever. It's crazy. So, as I said, the Hebrews are right in that part. They're saying, yeah, we came from Israel, but it's not where you originally come from. You know, this is where the doctrine was began and the backdrop they used to push the doctrine. It's not where you come from. You gotta understand what they're trying to do. And, and why they push in this doctrine to get you to accept Israel and leave alone the large, rich, you know, come on, it's rich. It has so many, it's so resource rich. It has so much there in Africa. Why the hell would you trade all that for Israel? Because you believe in some book that you don't read or follow. Come on. Y'all got to wake up out of this shit and understand what's going on or what the people are trying to do. All this stuff is trying to justify what happened to black people and why they took our shit by saying we sinned against God or it's God's will that they can go in and do this stuff. But at the same time, the book talks about love, peace, mercy and forgiveness. It's bullshit, but you got to do your own research, pay attention to what's going on and understand that you're being deceived. But I want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch and uh, see you guys next video.